Hi there and hello everybody and welcome to the Love City Arts podcast and TV show. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us today. On today's episode, I have Jay Wolf Slossberg Cohen. Excellent. You're awesome, who is a human artist and social activist based in Maryland. Thank you for being on the show today. Andre, I'm honored and I'm honored to be with your audience. Thank you. Yes, yes. In the pre-interview, uh, we were talking about everything. This guy's energy is beyond amazing. You can feel it coming through the screen. And I'm so grateful to talk about how he's giving his humanity and all of his love to the planet. So when I asked you pre-interview about what to bill you as, you said human. What <laughs> answer? Right, because, you know, I am an artist. I've been painting for 45 years, but I also grew up in the theater, and I'm going to be 65 soon. So I started, my parents would take us to the theater. My father performed at the age of, when I was two, he would take me to do, see him in community theater. Our house is where everybody ran away to. It was the baseball yard, the football yard, but more important, inside. I have three other siblings who are all amazing. All of our friends would come. My brother could play piano from the time he was born. And our house was a place that everybody could sing and dance and be themselves. My parents always supported everybody. And until the day they died, they touched the lives of thousands around the world. They set a path for us to understand what humanity is and what it is to be a human being. And the wow. colors wow. of my childhood were the arts, progressive Judaism, and family. And so with those three things, no matter how many people try to fuck us over in life, mm -hmm. we had that foundation, right? And, you know, like any people, we all had struggles and stuff, but that was the core of everything. And we were what, very... I mean, what, what were they saying in, around the, the dinner table that, that, made, that anchored this? Like, Our dinner discussions would be like a Charles Dickens novel. You never know how it was going to end. There was all these plots and all of us were trying to get in. Of course, I being the oldest felt that I had more to say, you know, my okay. sister would probably say something else, but it was basically, we were supported always. We, we all grew up in the theater. We all grew up singing, dancing, music. Uh, we grew up in a diverse group of people. We lived in a community, our block was not all Jewish, mostly Jewish, but not all around us. We weren't in the Jewish ghetto. We were in sort of a mixed area. Where was this? This is in Baltimore, sorry. Okay, yeah, Baltimore yeah. County, just above the city line. My great grandparents on all sides came from the 1890s, early 1900s. So my grandparents were born in Baltimore. My parents were born there. We were all close. I knew one of my great grandmothers. But it's important to understand that the idea of treating others fairly was very important. I grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust. I grew up with the civil rights movement, the women's movement. My mother took me to march with Dr. King in 1963 in the Great March in Washington. You, you marched yeah. there? Don't you recognize? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember you in the photos. Yeah, 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 man. We had to take those little yellow buses in that August of 1963, and it was so hot, right? But we were all, you know, brought these picnics, and we never even, there were so many people. We never even got to the Lincoln Memorial, but what I do remember is there were all these women and men and kids all arm in arm singing freedom, free, and then the, but the militia there, like we were going to blow up Washington. You know, we forget that, that they were. The power dynamic of, of people advocating for social justice and change versus this militant kind of, uh, uh, no authoritarian how do you say it authoritarian, authoritarian right. Right. yeah that was still in play even as it is today correct and even more so um we were just coming coming out of i grew up where you know if you were african-american you had to sit in the back of the bus it changed when i was a child but the main shopping area in downtown baltimore if you were black you couldn't shop there right and so our experiences were different however we were lucky because my grandparents set up a clothing business for middle class and professional African Americans in the late 1920s. In those days- a Dedicated space for them? Yes, because they weren't allowed, because of the color of their skin, to shop at the main, like imagine like at say, like at, uh, like at Saks Fifth Avenue, you couldn't go in because of the color of your skin. Right, right. And that was still in my lifetime. You know, it's 
and metamorphosize it as something still insidious and systemic racism is still there. We know that. Some things are better. But my grandparents had, had a clothing business, particularly for that population, because they couldn't shop anywhere. So because of that, my father grew up in that industry, in that business, and he would take us all to all the homes. So we were lucky to get to see other human beings live as human beings. We got to see, quote, unquote, the other, right? And then also being in the theater, mm -hmm. we, that was where I met my first gay friends, and we saw people from all backgrounds, and this was sort of the, the home of the other, which in our what family... Did learn, what did you learn from hanging out with the other? Well, that we're all human, I and mean, that's why I use that term. It's all this bullshit, you know. Yes, we're different, thank God. A friend of mine who was a, a graduate, uh, head of the graduate school, Maryland Institute College of Art, talked about many, many years ago, it's not that we are a melting pot where things are melted down and stripped away. That's what someone like Trump would rather have, where there is no identity, and he's in charge of the melting, right? We are actually a beautiful tapestry where we are woven together but we are celebrated by our uniqueness. So for those who are ultra conservative, the uniqueness part is the thing that scares everybody. For us who are believers in the uniqueness of each person, whether it's from a religious view, whether it's from your cultural view, whatever that's it's from. the beauty of that uniqueness. Yes. And that's what makes that, so I believe in the America that should be and could be, right? That's where my optimism lies. I have seen things in my work that everyone said would be impossible. You can't do this. I see it through the beautiful work my siblings do, what my parents, my, my nieces and nephews, my daughter, you know, my close friends. When, when I do my work, which is, you know, now I've been painting for 45 years, but for the last 20 years, I've been doing a lot of community-based public art. And talk about that. Yeah, when, talk when about children that. talk to me, they say, well, Mr. J, are you rich? So I laugh, I said, I said, Yes, in family and friends. Mm. That basis of my family's love uh, and this idea of whether it was through our Jewishness, where you had to make a difference, whether it was through our, my parents believing very strongly in the individuality of each child and our uniqueness, whether it was the idea of this getting out of our own world and meeting others in other worlds, whether it was religious, racial, and understanding that we're all connected, we're all Americans, and um, you know, all those things played, and the theater, I mean, the arts certainly, on top of all that was a unifying factor. Yeah.